Cosmo City, the world's heart of business, commerce, and culture. People of all kinds pack this metropolis, from humans and their offshoots to different creatures entirely. And yet, it never feels too crowded due to sheer, overwhelming size. You could spend a sleepless lifetime going from store to store, and you still might not see them all. If someone opens up a shop and does something even slightly unique, they're bound to do just fine. Because every soul is a unique market to fill. Everyone likes having that one little place around the corner to call home. Mind Escape Using nothing but the cutting edge of Magitech, Mind Escape offers a wholly unique experience combining virtual reality and the Mind Escape, letting your own subconscious act as an AI, procedurally generating an infinity of your favorite content from books to movies to music. Plus ads, of course. Though you can generate any type of media, the full experience lies in our immersive gaming. Now, while you're gaming, we may collect a thing or two from your brain, but don't worry, you already agree to the terms and conditions. But you, my friend, look like a high-class customer. For you, we offer an additional underground service. Have you been meaning to learn something, master a certain subject or skill? Well, in all likelihood, one of our lower customers has already done so. And for what we consider to be a perfectly reasonable fee, we can save you the trouble and simply upload their understanding into you. Be aware that you might find yourself experiencing some side effects after the transfer. Headaches, drowsiness, insomnia, foreign memories, hallucinations, and a small chance of sudden brain death. But I trust you understand no emerging technology is perfect. Regeneration Tunnels Many people, especially here in the city, tend to settle even minor disputes through a round or two of semi-friendly combat. Which is all well and good, except at certain times in the day when hospitals would get overrun with people who just needed a simple two-second healing job. So, the council voted to partner with food manufacturers to sprinkle mending machines all around the city. This was a brief band-aid of a solution at best. Those things could never get restocked fast enough. So to solve the problem once and for all, a coven of healers partnered with an assembled team of freelance enchanters and Magitech engineers to create the lovely regeneration tunnels we all use today. Just step onto the conveyor belt and let the regenerative aura engulf you. Though it's very important to remember that while the tunnel can heal the odd cut or scrape, your health points are somewhat divorced from your physical well-being. If you have an actual wound, you need to go to the hospital. Capitalist Brig But the companies behind the mending machines weren't too happy about being replaced. So naturally, they gathered all their machines from around the city and threw them into holes near the most popular tunnels, covering the pitfalls with barely detectable illusions. So, whether you're unaware or just forgetful, one wrong step walking down the street could send you tumbling into the capitalist brig. Unlike most traps, this one leaves your mind, body, and soul untouched. It's your wallet that takes the hit. To escape, you must buy one of the notoriously bad, low-healing, overpriced snacks or drinks. If you don't have any cash on you, don't worry. For a moderate fee, you can use the old ATM in the corner. You may have to give it a smack or two to get it working, though. Rumblings of a raid. The public's a little on edge after tonight's huge spike in portal gang sightings. None of the massed forces have actually done anything yet, but they're all unusually armed and ominously closing in on the warehouse district. Nobody really knows what to do with this information, though. The police were privatized a long time ago, so if corporate profits aren't directly on the line, they're not going to be doing much. And since the gang hasn't done anything yet, much less hurt innocents, local vigilantes aren't doing anything either. The Projectionist In a world where practically everyone has a super camera in their pocket, the generation's biggest rising filmmaker likes to keep it analog. Very analog. Cassidy here films with her eyes, records with her ears, and edits in her mind. Then, when she's done, she presents her films exclusively on her psychically linked projector. And when it comes to powers, that's only one side of the coin. With just a few seconds of eye contact, usually uncomfortably intense eye contact, she can watch your entire life story as a movie. Meaning, within moments, she knows exactly what makes you tick. 
plus your strengths, weaknesses, fighting style, secrets, making her, in a way, one of the most fearsome opponents you can face despite having zero actual combat abilities. The Gamer While the name may not have aged super well, her powers certainly have. Though everyone in this world functions on some vague, unseen leveling system, Gamer here takes it to the next level. She can open a menu to both actually see her stats and boost them using experience and skill points. Thanks to careful min-maxing, this got absurd real fast. After practically maxing out all her physical stats, like strength and speed in just a few years, she moved on to… everything else. Right now, she's a master musician, martial artist, lumberjack, chef, fisherwoman, miner, and she's currently working on blacksmithing. You wouldn't think it'd be possible to forge a sword with a single swing of the hammer, but… And what's more, the menu itself levels up too. Nowadays, she can see other stats, get dialogue suggestions, and get helpful descriptions of just about anything by checking it. The Carnival Lying unobtrusively on the outskirts, the Carnival is hands down one of the best sectors in the city. Populated by a tight-knit community of those with the wackier power sets like clowns and magicians, together they keep the place clean, efficient, fair, and cheap. You might think actually living here would get old fast, but the locals stay very happy. There's no one thing that does it, just a bunch of little details. Even at their worst, the lights and decor never quite get gaudy. At night, the jaunty music slows into more ambient, whimsical tracks. Food is varied and affordable, no $10 popcorn. They go all out with the seasons and holidays, the Halloween and Christmas celebrations are a must-see. And lastly, it's not all the same. You have your basic theme park section at the main entrance, but then there's the country fair, a fantastical, calming, magical forest, a sci-fi science fair, an Atlantean water park, and one almost hidden part that's a perfectly idealized small town's downtown. There's a tiny theater with original animated shorts, a 60s style diner, an adorable candy shop, a park centered around a classy merry-go-round, and there are little old-fashioned cars you can drive around. Technically, they're kid-sized, but they're sturdy enough for all ages. And, as the final cherry on top, the staff of each land keep the experience authentic. Gaian elves and dwarves run the forest, merfolk run the water park, actual engineers run the science fair, and so on. Virtual adrenaline pumps through the electric woman's veins as she careens above the city. The news announced the Portal Gang's raid a little later than expected, and there's not much room for error here. Reaching the warehouse district in record time, Rachel spots the containment facility and steals herself. This is where it gets good. Using a slanted roof as a ramp, she boosts herself full throttle as high as she can, and at the crest of her arc, she stands and falls. Plummeting, she uses her precious few seconds to scan the roof and, bingo, a satellite. Focusing in on it, her entire body begins to crackle and destabilize underneath her biking gear before it goes limp and falls away, her surging into the electrical system as a glitchy ball of energy. Concentrating, Rachel follows the wires to the one room that has both an active alarm and is using enough energy to be a cell. Bursting into the caged room, she reasserts her physical form, frying the alarm in the process. The containment pedestal already empty, she immediately rushes out through the violently ripped off heavy duty door. It's not hard to figure out which way to go next, just follow the trail of shattered sentinels desperately crawling after the portal thieves and their stolen briefcase. But reaching an escalator, Rachel meets her first obstacle, though perhaps that's a strong word. The portal guard wields a stun saber, a great weapon against most, but when the blunt, crackling stick strikes her cheek, her hard light flesh harmlessly absorbs the shock. Channeling the surge through her body, she gathers it in her fist and decks the guard with a tasing punch. 
Before he can get up, Rachel's eyes flicker with power as she crouches down to lightly touch a controlling finger to the escalator, forcing it into overdrive. Flying to the top in a breakneck two seconds, she cancels her momentum with a well-timed glitch dash to save herself from shooting through the ceiling. But when she lands, her body lurches and she falls on her back. Apparently, the escalators transitioned into a pair of moving walkways, now also running dangerously fast. Struggling to her feet against the momentum, blurs of red and blue dart around her, and before she even realizes what's going on, she's already surrounded. Before her, blue. She's already been down this road, so she skips to the end. With a snap and a point, she strikes him down with a bolt of electricity. Confidence restored, Rachel whips around to deal with the other guy, Duke's raised for a fight. Just in time to get a red stun saber to the neck. Wide-eyed, she falls to her knees, immobilized. Turns out, Blue's shock, reds absorb. But soon, just as her vision starts to blur, the hot, dangerously humming weapon overloads on her life force, exploding in the man's hand in a show of sparks. Freed, Rachel stays knelt on the ground among her recovering opponents for a moment, airlessly gasping as she regains her composure. Just as she was about to stand again, her attention suddenly snaps to the big, closed metal door the three of them are rocketing straight for. On pure instinct, she huddles her weakened enemies together and hugs them close, shielding them from the coming impact. But it comes a little later than expected. In the brief time they're airborne, the door splits open fast enough to welcome them inside. Skidding back first into the dark, blue-tinged room, Rachel finally rolls to a stop, hitting a concrete pillar. With a great deal of willpower, she takes only a second before forcing her exhausted eyes open and quickly checking on the two portal guards. Red's shaken up, but okay, and Blue's just fully unconscious. Gently letting them to the ground, Rachel struggles halfway to standing before finally noticing the two figures standing over her. The rogue sentinel and the leader of the portal gang herself. Between them, clutched in the sentinel's hand, the briefcase. Rachel's mind kicks into overdrive. The robot's easy, but the leader's a wild card. But before she can decide on her first move, the sentinel speaks. You are neither with us nor them. Why do you interfere? Straightening, Rachel replies, I'm gonna need that briefcase. Hmm, very well, the Sentinel replies, calmly raising his palm blaster to her face. I believe this will deal significant damage even to a creature like you, unless you reconsider your position. But he was standing way too close. Focusing her technokinesis into her foot, she forces him to reboot on the spot. Sorry, buddy, bad matchup. But the leader wastes no time either. Reaching into a bag on her belt, she throws a handful of maroon sand into Rachel's face. But the moment she reacts, the leader summons it all back to her hand and forges it into a shard of dark glass. Just as Rachel's getting over the sand trick, the shard splits into three and shoots itself at her, piercing her hard light skin, stabbing her in the chest, shoulder, and side. Recoiling more from shock than pain, electric blood soaks her clothes as the glass embedded in her runs an inky black injecting the flowing, churning substance into her. A system of eldritch veins quickly spread from the wound, closing in on the game disc at her core. Shock boiling into rage, Rachel locks her reddened gaze onto the leader's glowing mask. Turning all the focus she can to feeling for the battery pack, she senses it and forces a critical failure. Overheating on her face, the woman manages to rip it off before the explosion. Detecting no more tech on her enemy, Rachel weakly raises her arm to throw a bolt of lightning. But by now, the infection is latched onto her disc, sapping her energy at an alarming rate, so the attack whimpers out at her fingertip. Lightheaded with blackening vision, she collapses into a kneel, feebly using the moments before she falls to ask the question she's been wondering since she got this mission. What do you guys even want with her? The leader freezes, taken aback. Her? She questions, cocking her head in genuine confusion. Is there a person in here? But Rachel just stares ahead blankly, head slumping. So, with a snap, the leader shatters the dark glass. Source cut off, the inky, eldritch veins dissipate with a wet, guttural screech of protest. Jerking back to semi-alertness, Rachel catches herself on the pillar to steady her shaking legs. Much too soon after all of that, 
the leader rushes up to Rachel and places a concerned hand on her damaged shoulder. Hey, you okay? Rachel silently stares the girl down with a tired scowl. Ah, come on. I sick the angel on you, you try to blow my face off. I say we're about even. So hi, I'm Amelia. Grinning, the unmasked leader extends her hand. Rachel, the glitched girl replies, denying the handshake. So what's this about a person then? Amelia asks, raising the briefcase for emphasis. Yeah, I don't know. Rachel replies, some guy just hired me to save a friend of his. Rescues from weird places are kind of my thing, so... She trails off, gesturing around vaguely. Damn it! Amelia curses to herself. What? Well, the whole point of all this is to save some people. I'm not going to sacrifice someone to do it. A beat of silence. Then, Amelia's eyes light with an idea. You just need who's inside, right? Then here, let's crack this open right now. You take the prisoner, I take the prison. Deal? Rachel lightly shrugs with one shoulder. Great! So, Amelia unlatches the briefcase, rays of whitish-blue light spilling from within as she ceremoniously turns it to Rachel and pulls it open with the blinding flash of a seal being broken. Inside the shallow, black velvet-cushioned case lies an ancient purple knight's mask. Instantly, Rachel feels the weight of this item, hushed awe overcoming the confusion that this is by no means a person. Gently reaching in, the moment the first pixel of her finger touches the smooth purple metal, Rachel feels the soul inside stirring, just now waking from a long, nightmare-filled slumber. The spirit's unfathomably old, there's no doubt there, but it doesn't feel it. An unmistakably youthful fury saturates the mask's every atom. Well, have a nice night then, Amelia cheerfully calls out, clamping the briefcase closed as her robotic companion finally finishes his forced software update. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rachel replies, highly distracted as the portal pair, plus a squad of guards, including the two from earlier, stroll to the garage door at the end of the room, absolutely rip it out of the wall, discover there's nothing outside but a free fall, and jump off anyway, vanishing with a flash of orange.